After 25 years of the fight against AIDS in America, the disease continues to spread. And although the HIV AIDS epidemic has touched every corner of society, urban black and Latino communities continue to see disproportionately high rates of infection. Half of all new HIV cases occur in young people under the age of 25. Of these, three quarters comes from communities of color. Educational campaigns that promote condom use and testing oversimplify the problem by failing to address larger social and economic problems. Incarceration, substance abuse, homelessness, high school dropouts, unstable home life, and homophobia are all factors that have been proven to dramatically increase the risk for infection. It's kind of hard to get our people uh, to understand the importance of the AIDS crisis when it takes 10 to 11 years to develop and they've got to deal with a crisis that's already on their plate in front of them so AIDS gets backed up behind some of the other issues. These issues are shown through the stories of the young people in this film. Kareem, Shamika, and Serenity face immediate challenges in their urban New York communities which put them at high risk for HIV. And these challenges shed light on why our communities are still battling the AIDS crisis. When the whole HIV thing came out, man, I, I mean, let me tell you something, man. Every chick, every chick I've ever dealt with makes me think twice. Am I going to go to the doctor and he's going to say, take these pills until you die? Forever. Said, Yo, man, that's a serious thought, man. That's, that's not, you know, that's, that's not herpes, man. That's not syphilis. That's not a couple of shots in the tush and, and you know, take two of these and call me in the morning because that, that's... I had a couple of women, been, and it make me feel funny, though. Yeah. I'm being real. Now, so I might have bragged about it, but once a real, like, on a person, you know, like, when I do shit like that, that shit, I don't know about other niggas, but it make me feel funny, make me feel less of a man, because I know I could conduct myself in a better way. I'm in a buck fifty, B. I ain't horse hotel. What's that? Go sleep on the train, B. Smash that out. Wake up in the morning. Go see my eye keys at the store. Let me get a Lucy a quarter water oatmeal cream pop. That be breakfast, B. Keep it moving. I mean, my mother don't know this. But one day, me and I was in a crib in the Bronx. The reason why we left the Bronx because the marshals came in and kicked in the door. Because we was in a crack house, living in a crack house with guns, crack. And we just had to bolt through the fire escape out the back window. We had a little hustle side to side. I ain't saying I don't care. I ain't incriminating myself. But we had a little thing here and there. Drugs came into play, like, usually you don't hear me talk about drugs, and a lot of people don't know, like, the shit I did. It's so drugs, break the rules, be a badass. Smoke your weed, not listen to nobody. Like, it's something I, I was good at. I could have been great at it, but it just broke me down. Now, I came across a lot of gangs. Bloods, Crips. Gangs are important to young black men because family. It's unity to them. Some people, that's the only thing they got in life. I totally be sad about it. That sums it up. I mean, when you got a family, you in a family for life. It's something that bond. It's something that's deeper than being blood related, whatever. I was stripped of my childhood. Like, my innocence just got taken away from me from 14 and up. It's like when shit just started getting real hard going down the road. It's like, I wish I could take them years back. I wish I could get a lot of years back. I needed my mother a lot of times. But it was like we was never on the same page. 16, 17, 18, 19, I needed my mom. My pops was never a pops to me, no matter even when he came back into my life. He's never a father. I'm scared. I don't want to be out here no more. Many young black men like Kareem are drawn to drug money because of their economic reality. The opportunity to hustle is difficult to resist when the unemployment rate for black men with a high school diploma is 50% and 72% without one. But when young people hustle, they don't realize that it is a risk for HIV 
because it leads to incarceration, where HIV prevalence is four times higher. A lot of the young men who are going into places like Rikers Island live in the Bronx. So they're, they're, they're going into the prison system and then when they're released, they're coming back into the Bronx. And a lot of these young men get infected in the prison system. When they enter the prison system, they're getting tested for HIV because it's mandatory. And upon releasement, they're not getting tested. There's no way you can have protect, protected sex. You're not supposed to be having sex in jail at all. Prisons are not letting condoms go through. You know, some of them don't know they got it. Some of them don't care they got it. Some of them know how to go about treating it. So we end up, we all end up feeling it. Number down. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Mickey, did you use condoms on you not the age of 14? All the time. Yeah. Well, not with this one guy. Now he ain't in jail. <laughs> he in jail for fucking you without a condom? No. He go to jail for? Crack? Yeah. Uh, you you got any jail men? My baby father. Uh -huh. One day I was at the club. I was intoxicated as always, and he like, oh, Mika, who you gonna holler at me, spin that game in my ear. And alcohol saying, yeah, let's go, let's go. Me go for, I'm telling you, the sober side that I still got a little bit left in me is like, you remember him, everybody slept him, girl, just find somebody else in here. But you know, alcohol took over, went to the house with him, did what we had to do. From that on, we've been sleeping together. I thought I could trust him. I didn't feel like he was sleeping with nobody else. But all the while he was, because while I was pregnant, somebody else was pregnant by him. He was a great daddy. He was always there for her, buying her stuff, but it was just, he was doing it the illegal way. He was making like, maybe like a thousand dollars every three days. You know, if you quit that and you can get a job, but it's hard to get a job that's really making money when he can make the same amount of money in two hours. Being in the streets and being a hustler and going to jail, and that took a strain on me too, like, you know. But it all through, it ruins his life. Just ruined it. There's no way now he can make that up for what he did. Because he's been locked up too many times. And after a while, it becomes a felony. So I never know if he was coming to my house one day or going to jail the next. So, I mean, and he's still locked up to this day. So, in and out, in and out, in and out. A lot of young women like Shamika knowingly put themselves at risk for HIV by not using condoms with their boyfriends, believing that their partners are monogamous, when in fact, they are not. But Shamika isn't thinking about HIV in this way, because she faces more immediate challenges. Shamika was born in the 80s to a crack-addicted mother. Shamika herself struggles with substance abuse. To my mother, we have the same attitude, so it always clashes. We can't talk about nothing without arguing. She can't help me do better if she's still doing what I was doing when I was 16. How can you? How can I look up to you when all you want to do is party and bullshit? And then when I come to you and I'm thinking about doing something good, it's like, oh, wow, you're too late now. You should have did it when you was this age. That type of shit, I don't want to hear. Oh, we're going to wind up fighting. Yeah, Looney, it's me. Hi, Looney. I fell in love with her off the bat. She was a sweetheart. I got her to get her license. I got her to get into school. She's been with me for almost four years now. She was talking to me and, you know, said that I seem like a nice person and, you know, we're going to have a plan. And if I could follow the plan, then, you know, she'll help me, which was interesting for me, you know. I've never really sat down and had a plan. I just go for the goddamn day. Being with different guys, and but I'm not saying everybody goes through it, but most of the people I know go through it. Alcohol, once again, taking me over. I'd wake up and he'd be gone, and I'd be like, <laughs> you know, like, where the fuck am I? You know, and somebody once told me that, you know, you get so drunk where somebody can have their way with you, one day you're going to wind up in some real trouble. You're going to get raped, and 
Thank God I ain't never get raped, but everybody always said, you're going to get raped. You're gonna, why? Why you be wishing that on me? Most of the time I use condoms. Unless I just was like, if I was fucking you for longer than two months, then maybe not. But if I was just fucking you every once in a blue, of course I was using condoms. I wasn't really like that stupid. Like, oh, no, we don't have to use condoms. Come on. Mm, I see it, dick. You don't got nothing. <laughs> now, we going to use them. Because uh, what's not on the outside may be on the inside. So, yeah, I was pretty much trying to wrap it up when I could. When I was alert, I was wrapping it up. When I was twisted, I'd tell you. But if you didn't, hey, fuck it, then I, I just have to deal with the consequences in the morning or whenever the hell I got up. <laughs> Young women from unstable homes without a strong bond to a parent are at a greater risk for substance abuse, and the chances of their sexual partners being infected are high in urban settings. This can then put them at risk for HIV because they're more likely to engage in unprotected sex when they're under the influence. Can you give a quick summary of your coming out story? Ah! Are you not out? I got kicked out of my house. I came out the closet when I was 14 and got gay bashed at the same time. And to already know that to my father, I'm a plague and I'm a, a parasite. It, it hurts when all I've really tried to ever do was be his son. Faggots get shot out there. Niggas would shoot us. People don't understand that being gay and being in high school is not the easiest thing. You're risking your life by even going to high school. Like, you're risking your life by going to school every day. You don't know if you're going to make it home. Homophobic is, is an excuse for being scared. The transgender community is one of the hardest hit by the epidemic, with HIV rates as high as 25 percent in some urban areas. For trans youth, one of the many risks is sharing needles for black market hormonal therapy. Transgender, lesbian, and gay youth face a host of other risk factors. There are a lot of young people, especially um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender youth, who are being kicked out of their homes because of their sexual orientation, because young people are coming out at a younger and younger age, and unfortunately are being kicked out. They're homeless. They have to find a way to eat. They have, a, they have to find a place to stay, and a lot of these young people end up going into prostitution. I would go and have two lipsticks, and I would put one on top of the other, and it would make my lips look amazing. I made a lot of money when I first started in the village. You know, like, every day that I would go out there was another guy, a client, a chick, a Joe, whatever you want to call them. They would come up, and they would pick me out of a crowd out of 20. It was, like, easy, quick money. Ooh, child, I'm an old school girl. These new girls are like crackheads. They get like 10, 20 dollars a fucking blow. But I'm an old school girl. I used to get a hundred dollars for one blow job. I wound up homeless because um, my mother was. It was hard for her to accept my sexuality. I left on my own. You know, they didn't want to return home, so I wound up homeless. To and. I was going from train to train, shelter to shelter, and sex working at the same time just so that I had money in my pocket, food to eat, clothing on my back. I really didn't know the streets. I didn't know nothing really. During the day, I would try to be over anyone else's house, or I would be roaming the village all day long until I had no other choice but to go home which was the crack house at that time. I would walk in and immediately you would smell the crack and the mixture of the dope and angel dust and you would just smell it and that was enough to drive me crazy. After a while it was like, I just couldn't take it. Getting a job nowadays for someone like us is one in a million, really. Nobody wants a male or female or a man dressed in women's clothing working in their company because it's not accepted by society. You know, there's a lot of places that trans women go to, you know, make their money at, and it's always doing the same thing, prostituting. When I first started, honey, <laughs> I was a big bitch. I mean, I've had all kinds of, all kinds. <laughs> it really, it, it depended on what I was willing to do that night and what I felt like doing that night. I got lucky while I was out here. 
I was real lucky while I was doing my thing. I've lost a lot of friends from prostitution, actually. I've lost a lot of my girls. A lot of people that I felt close to died prostitution. They got in a car and nobody found them until, until they were decapitated, keep decapitated in a fucking river somewhere. I never got through high school. I was like three days in high school. But my junior high school had sex education class. Ours, like many others, only believed in teaching abstinence only rather than safer sex methods. It was strictly abstinence. So protection was never something that I actually did with my clients. Many LGBT youth experience harassment and even violence at school because of their sexuality or gender identity. Unfortunately, many are forced to leave school prematurely. People see me and they're like, oh, that's a man, and I'm like, nothing. You know, just, I just walk, like, don't even bother acknowledging what they say. But when I'm in the street, it looks like I act like I'm the shit. Like, I have everything and I don't need nobody, and, you know, it's just a little disguise to go and keep people off my back, basically. You know. intelligence, talent, charisma, it, it, it's all inside of him. Unfortunately, what the street does is the street makes you push all of that down for survival. And people do what they have to do to, to survive first. And after we learn how to survive, then we can learn how to live. And, and Kareem is at that place where he's about to start learning how to live. Look at Kali, look what he did to me. Like, I'm gonna be real, if it wasn't for Kali, I think I would've really went to jail, because Kali, like, really, he makes me think. Tell him, yo, you're my brother, my cousin, my pops, my best friend. He came from the same hood, but had to face the same niggas I got to face, deal with the same gangs I had to face. And, you know, he didn't pick the gun up, he didn't bang out. He probably was, you know, pressed for money. He didn't feel the need to hit the block with crack, something like that, you know. And he doing good right now. He teaching, so I look at it as like, yo, I could do my thing like that, yo. I can do it. I ain't got to sit there and go towards the streets. I plan to go back to school. I want to get my bachelor's in political science. I think I'll contribute a lot to my community. You know, I can do a lot, you know, involving politics because I'm aware of a lot of things that go on. And I got more contact with the direct, you know, hoodlums and thugs in the streets, you know. I can talk to them and they listen to me and they respect me for what I do. You sex jump off. I don't know what you want to get on the court, man, do a little workout. How do you know that her mom is HIV positive? Because her mother told me. Got that information from the horse's mouth. Samantha told me herself. Did you purposely not tell me she was positive? Or did you just not think about it? It wasn't just... on my mind, you know what I mean? But I'm not ashamed of it. It's a thousand people who's positive. At least she knows. People don't know. So. Do you guys talk about it? Do you know how she got it? I guess intercourse. But that's how she says. But uh, that's probably it. But it don't bother me. I did not purposely tell you. I just wasn't thinking about it because we was just talking about sex. <laughs> if I could get anything I wanted. It would probably be a stable house with my two kids. I enjoy being crazy. Sometimes I like to be calm. On like days like this when I'm tired and look stupid, yeah, I'm calm. Any other day if it's like crowded, I'm probably running up and down the block bothering people, running in the store, taking stuff, running out, <laughs> making them chase me, getting wet, drinking, you know. I do it while I'm young and I got the time. Sooner or later, I have to stop. <laughs>
Thank God I got, you know, a good godmother that babysits and like when I need a break, I break. Mommy. <laughs> yes, for baby. about three weeks. <laughs> That's my phone. <laughs> yeah. I was 19, I'm um, 17, <laughs> when, I found, when I found out mm -hmm. that I was positive. I was yes. horrified of the reaction my friends would have. Didn't tell nobody at first. About four months after, you know, I got used to the thought and I was like, you know what, fuck it. Either they're gonna like me anyway, they're gonna be my friend either way, or they're not. It's just gotten easier, you know? And with all my friends, you know, if HIV comes up in any conversation, I find a way to go and state that I am positive in, uh, um, within that conversation. I didn't go back to sex working for about another four months. So I was escorting online and my profile stated I was HIV positive. So I had a hard time making money, but at the same time, I was like, it's better off me telling them that I'm positive ahead of time than them getting it from me the way I got it from someone else, unwillingly, unknowing. Every single person has the same basic need. We need shelter, we need food, we need water, and of course we need love. And what happens is, is that many people put themselves at risk for contracting HIV in an attempt to satisfy these basic needs. Whether it's um, using drugs to be in with certain people that will help fulfill those needs, whether it's a prostitute selling her body for money or for food, a person who hasn't eaten in two weeks um, will tell you, you know, I will go over there and give that guy a blowjob to get this money so that I can get something to eat and not worry about HIV later. People's basic needs have to be met. Until our young men stop believing that the measure of their manhood has to do with how many sexual partners they have, and until our young women begin to believe that sexuality is not going to build their self-worth and that it's a false sense of self-value that it gives them until we begin to understand these very basic things all sexually transmitted diseases including HIV um, including teen pregnancy and um, broken families um, which would just create more to, more of that is going to it's just going to continue it's a self-perpetuating problem Kareem, Shamika, and Serenity shared their stories with me and provided insight as to what it means to be a young person growing up in an urban setting. HIV does not exist in a vacuum, and we have to address the context out of which this disease is spread. If we examine all the pieces of the puzzle, like homelessness, substance abuse, broken families, prison, homophobia, lack of educational opportunities, then we will find lasting solutions that will protect communities from being vulnerable, not just from the spread of HIV, but from other epidemics that might arise in the future.